Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Thank, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, anyway, I want to tell you as I always do, I'm going to violate uh, speaking 101 right away, and I'll be walking in front of the projector to make sure that you're awake over there and coming back and forth. So, excuse me, I'm a walker. I've managed to do that chewing gum and walking thing, so I do walk around here. But I want to thank you all of you for coming tonight because uh, this is a really interesting topic. Some of you have heard me speak previously on nature, science, science education, evolution, and a variety of other topics. And tonight's topic kind of folds into that group of topics quite nicely. Because we live, without a doubt, in the most scientifically oriented and achieved and technologically oriented society we've ever lived in, the planet has ever seen. And we live in the country that, without a doubt, is the most scientifically advanced and technologically advanced. So with that saying, think then, why do we still have these challenges and opportunities when it comes to science education? Why do we still have the evolution deniers? Why do we still have the climate change deniers? And now why do we have kind of the trifecta with the vaccine deniers? And that's the question is, why is this? So initially, our knee-jerk reaction is, well, it has to be the same people. Because clearly, if they don't accept evolution, they clearly don't accept climate change, and they clearly can't be vaccinating their kids. Or so you might think, right? That's the thesis we're going to look at tonight. Is this, in fact, the same group of individuals? Are they drinking the same punch? Is it the same kind of you know, ideas and experience that brings them to this conclusion? And you might be kind of surprised at what we find here tonight. Because this is a bit of a paradox <laughs> as to why we are where we are today. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to take a look here at, first of all, the anti-vaccination movement. Where are we now? What are we facing? What do we see happening in the United States? What do we see happening in Michigan? What do we see happening in Kent County? Then we're going to take a look at an introduction to science, immunology 101, as close as we can get it, as tightly as we can get it, so we can understand the value of a vaccine, the value of a vaccination. And then we're going to take a look at the anti-vaccination movement. How did we get to where we are today? Are there some events happening in society that maybe has taken us to where we are today and the public attitudes towards the vaccination of children and adults? And then we'll finish with why vaccinations matter. Should we care about this? The answer is going to be, I'm hoping, yes, as we leave tonight. So the question is, where are we now? Okay? And I have to apologize for this picture, but I thought, I thought, I thought it was just too sweet to leave out of the front. You know, I'll wrap the entire presentation around that picture if I have to. Okay? It just gives you so many concerns there. So, so the question is, you know, where are we now? How did we get to where we are in the United States? Well, in each state, all of our states allow in K-12 education, pre-kindergarten education, some type of exemption to vaccinations. And what are those allowable reasons from state to state? One of which is a medical exemption, that your student, your child doesn't have to have a vaccination if there's a medical reason not to. I think we're all on that page, we get it. Because it's possible to have a child, an adult, that is immune suppressed, that actually just by giving them a vaccination could cause them greater harm than the receipt of it. So I don't think anybody's gonna contest that. It's a wise medical decision. How about allergies to a vaccine? Some vaccines, flu vaccine, for instance, is usually incubated in chicken eggs. What if you have an allergy to chicken egg albumin? There is an issue there. So we understand, certainly, those children, those adults may not be great candidates for at least some of the vaccines. Another reason you can have an exemption in Michigan schools, and this is true across the United States, for almost all the states, you can have a religious exemption, saying that it's against my faith to have vaccination. And all states allow this except Mississippi and West Virginia. Which is interesting that Mississippi and West Virginia haven't had a measles outbreak since the early 1990s. Could there be cause and effect? Okay, I throw that out for your early consideration this evening, okay? You can also have a philosophical or a personal belief waiver. 20 states offer this as of 914. And guess what? Mississippi and West Virginia don't allow this. Who would have ever thought in their wildest dreams that we would be looking to West Virginia and Mississippi for modeling our science policy? But here we are, okay, ahead of the pack there. So you have these three options here to say that I don't care to have my child vaccinated. 
So who can opt out? Here's kind of a little snapshot nationally. If we look at whatever color that is, um, salmon color, the darker the two beiges are, these states allow philosophical waivers. If we look at the states in blue, which look is Mississippi and West Virginia, you can only have medical waivers. You can't have philosophical waivers. You can't have religious waivers. And so we look at those states that are in that lighter color gray, no philosophical waivers, okay, only medical waivers, no religious waivers. So let's take a look here at the rate of non-medical vaccine exemptions by state. So as you can see on our scale in the upper left-hand side, the darker the color, the greater percentage of the population has a non-medical vaccine waiver. So this would be philosophical, religious exemption. Now we can see if we look at Michigan, unfortunately, it's one of the darker states, okay? Sad moment for Michigan, okay? So, in fact, Michigan has the third lowest pre-kindergarten vaccination rate in the U.S. as of last year. If you want to look at it the other way, 47 other states are ahead of us on this scale, okay? Including Louisiana, including Texas, including Alabama and Georgia, okay? States that had bills to make exemptions easier or harder. If we go back and look from 2009 to 2012, the most recent data available, during that time period, there were 36 bills introduced in 18 different states to change the manner in which you can get one of these non-medical exemptions. And in 31 of these cases, 31 to the 36, they were designed to make it easier than it currently is. The good news is none of those passed which is really kind of surprising, okay? So how hard is it to get a vaccine in your state? So take a look at where we are, take a look at where you've lived in the past, and just kind of look, it's a hodgepodge, isn't it? There is no obvious trend where the East Coast is different from the West Coast, that the Midwest is different from the South. It's a checkerboard here of rhyme and reason of these different statutes. So you look at this kind of broad data saying, oh, there's gotta be, there has to be a theme here. Look at the West Coast, look at the Western states. You know, they're all about the same. Look at the Southeast, they're all about the same. Well, it gets kind of messy after that. Let's take a look at a Michigan update. Because in that previous slide, we saw that Michigan is rated as medium, okay? What do you need to get a non-medical waiver in Michigan? You need a healthcare professional's signature. The definition of a healthcare professional is all over the board. Don't confuse that with physician for a second. Okay, but we have an update here. As of January 1st this year, the law has changed. Michigan parents still have the right to refuse to have their children uh, vaccinated by the required vaccinations by the state. But as of January 1st, they now have to be educated, quote unquote, by a local health worker, quote unquote, about vaccines and the diseases vaccines are intended to prevent. But that's better than where we were. I mean, it's certainly a step in the right direction. Also, the parents have to sign what is now we're in Michigan we're referring to as a universal state form that includes a statement of acknowledgement by the parent that they understand that failing to have their children vaccinated could result in their harm, the children, as well as harm to others. So this is going the right direction. So maybe we can get rid of that sad face in Michigan. I said maybe, English. Okay, so let's take a look at this state by state. So the data we have up here, I recognize back in the cheap seats, you can't read this, so I'm gonna walk you through this here. On the left-hand side here, we have our states. Whole bunch of data here we're not gonna worry about. What we're concerned about are these non-medical exemptions. The row that I've highlighted in red represents the number of religious exemptions plus the philosophical exemptions, if the state allows them, and then the total exemptions and then the percentage of the students in that state. So if we take a look, there really aren't any heavy hitters in this first chart until we get down to here. Idaho and Illinois, 5.5% of the students have a non-medical waiver. 4.8% of in Illinois have that. That's a sizable percentage, as we'll see here in a little bit. Now we come over here and we take a look at the same chart, same distribution, just a continuation of the states. And if you look at the first one there, Michigan, <coughs> okay, we're at 5.3, so 5.3% of our students currently have a non-medical exemption. You get down another Oregon, we're down at 6.4. We have a few states left here. Vermont being the biggie right here at 5.7.
So if you haven't been tapping your foot and following that, what does this all mean? It means that the highest non-medical exemption rates in the U.S., the top five, Michigan is number four. What's that call for? <laughs> okay, so we're in the top four there. So 5.3. And again, you say, well, these are tiny numbers. Okay, well, let's see if they're significant or not. So how about waiver rates by county? The darker the red or burgundy, whatever color this is, the higher the, the uh, non-medical waiver rate. So we look at, at Houghton County up here. That's pretty significant. Sheboygan, Emmett, and Leelanau. So these are the big leaders right here as far as medical exemptions, excuse me, non-medical exemptions. Let's take a look here. If we looked at it by every single county, if we look, and again, I'll read these to you because I know that it's hard to see where you are. If we look over here at Houghton, in 2013-14, it was 15.4. It's gone up to 17.5. We look over here at Lapeer County, which is right over here. Here's Lapeer County. Lapeer County, pretty much st stable. 12% in 2013-14, 12.3. Leelanau, which is right up here. Look at this. Leelanau went from 19.5 to 12.4. Interesting. Yeah, kind of interesting. So still incredibly high but at least moving in the right direction. We look over here, we see Roscommon. Roscommon is right up here. Roscommon, look at this. We went from 2.7 to 12.2 in one year. What's in the water? Okay, so I mean, how do we have this, this dramatic change? The green arrows deserve a happy face, okay? Sheboygan, all the, look at 18.5 down to eight. So something's happening in Sheboygan County. It's because I was up there last year lecturing and not, <laughs> yeah, okay. And over here in Midland, Midland is right over here. Midland, look at this. We've gone from 12.1 down to 5.5. That's the home of Dow Chemical, you know, so, uh, and you look up here at Lino, of course, the home of Traverse City, et cetera. So it's really kind of interesting. Again, what we don't see here is any obvious geographical distribution, what appears to be any rhyme or reason to the high non-medical vaccination exemption rates versus the low rates. So with that in mind, let's put that to rest for a second. So we can see that nationally, statewide, we have some challenges and opportunities because we're not seeing this groundswell of people saying, vaccination's a good idea, I want to do it. So before we go any further, let's do a little immunology 101 here. Take you back to biology. When I see a lot of my students here tonight, and thanks for coming on. We've seen this lecture, can we just move on? This will be the Reader's Digest Clip Notes version of this, okay? So when we take the human body, we divide it into, depending how you're counting, 9, 10, 11, 12 body systems. And it's really, that's an artificial division, it's really just one body system, but our little human brains can't wrap around you and all at once. So we divide it into 9, 10, 11, 12 body systems. And so the body system that usually people refer to right now is the immune system. Do you see immune system listed anywhere up there? No because the immune system is really one of the functions of the lymphatic system. So it's one of the job assignments of lymphatic system. So lymphatic system is the one that's responsible here for our immunity, for a lot of our resistance to disease, our response to pathogens. Pathogens, we're just gonna refer as the bad guys, right? These can be what? These could be bacteria, they could be viruses, they could be fungus, they could be nematodes, they could be, you know, let's just take a look at nematodes, let's deal with the microbes. Let's talk about viruses, bacteria, fungus, and also a weird group of proteins called prions. How does our body respond to invading pathogens, the bad guys? We're gonna divide this into two broad categories, something called nonspecific defenses, and something called specific defenses, which is where we wanna go tonight. It's number two that we're really concerned about. So we're gonna talk about number one, but that's just immunology, immunology foreplay. Just to get you warmed up for the good stuff here at number two, okay? So what's a nonspecific defense? A nonspecific defense, as the name implies, is the response that our body has to a pathogen regardless of the actual type of pathogen. Here's the analogy I would draw. Okay, it's three o'clock in the morning, the bedroom window opens, and somebody crawls into your bedroom. Is your first concern to interview this person for their previous criminal history, okay? Are you a first time felon and a second time? Do you prefer a machete or a hatchet or a gun for the murder you're about to commit? You don't matter, right? Because your response should be the same no matter what, right? To dial 911 or lock and load, whatever your particular MO is, okay? <laughs> but it's gonna be the same no matter what, right? It doesn't matter who's crawling through. It's, your response is nonspecific to the person crawling through. If it was Sasquatch, if it was a zombie, you'd well, zombies have special requirements 
comments, I know. But you know, the response is pretty much going to be the same. And so our body has a lot of these nonspecific responses. Whether it's bacteria, species A, B, C, D, Z, it doesn't matter, the response is the same. If it's a virus, the response is the same. It doesn't matter because the body is going to respond the same way. For instance, fever. Fevers are miraculous. Uh, miraculous, careful, okay, is a wonderful response to invading pathogens. And it doesn't matter, the fever response is the same again, whether in most cases it's any species of bacteria or whether it's a fungus, whether it's a, a protist, a lot of the responses will be the same. Fever is a nonspecific response, as is the case with inflammation. Inflammation has a lot of benefits. One of the things inflammation does, it keeps that pathogen in the area. You circle the wagons until the cowboys and the white hats, the white blood cells arrive. And so it's a great way of keeping pathogens localized. That's going to happen regardless of what the pathogen is. The integument, another nonspecific defense. If you want to get a little grossed out, because I haven't grossed you out, I haven't done my job, this is the human skin. So these are your, it looks like elephant hide, doesn't it? Okay, those are your squamous cells. A little closer over here, these are cocci bacteria. Here's an individual skin cell. Look at that. This is what we commonly refer to now as this microbiome. Living on you right now, you have over 100 species of bacteria. What do you want to do about that? Get a better class of friends. Don't sit next to him. Okay, so it's there. It's fine. It's benign. In fact, they don't do us any harm in 99% of the cases. But your skin, your integument, when it's intact, nonspecific defense. Keeps fungus out, keeps the bacteria out, keeps the viruses out. Okay? And this is also going to be the case with another nonspecific defense, which are proteins. We produce all kinds of protective proteins. Some of you have heard about maybe, for instance, interferons before or defensins. And these are groups of proteins that also work in a nonspecific manner to challenge proteins, even, to, excuse me, to challenge pathogens, as well as, for instance, viruses coming into our body. Miscellaneous chemicals. How about your stomach? Do you have any idea what you ingested today? Especially if you went out to a restaurant, okay? Think of all the nasties that wound up in your stomach. The good news is they go kerplunk into the acid, and it's your acid, the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, it hovers around 2.0. It's nasty stuff. Very few things make it pass. Doesn't matter what goes kerplunk, it's toast, okay? How about salt? See the sweaty shirt right here, the salt on there? You know when you exercise, lick your skin, lick somebody else's skin that's exercised, they make, make sure you know them first, and then you'll taste all the salt that happens to be in there. Tears. Your tears have special enzymes called lysozymes to prevent bacteria and other organisms from living in the conjunctiva. It's a nonspecific defense. Mucous membranes. Do you know your head has three big old cavities in it? And those big old cavities are supposed to support, not your brain, three other cavities for mucous membranes. You produce all kinds of mucus. What? It's like a magic carpet ride for pathogens down into the digestive tract where it goes kerplunk again. These are nonspecific defenses. Phagocytosis. Phagocytosis occurs by white blood cells. White blood cells are kind of like biological Pac-Men. They come up to pathogens and they gobble them up, as you see happening over here. Let me describe, we'll come back to that picture in a second. What's a phagocyte? It's a white blood cell that participates in this Pac-Man-like behavior, the phagocytosis. Some of you biologists in here know about neutrophils, macrophages, mast cells, eosinophils, basophils. So what they do is really kind of cool. If we go back and take a look here, when I had biology 100 years ago, we had stone tablets and we had black and white drawings of what we thought was happening. Our students now have color photographs of it actually happening. It's so cool. And we were right about virtually everything. Okay, and so, but if we take a look over here, look at this. Here's a, here's a cell right here, a white blood cell. The green guys are bacteria. These little structures coming out, it's kind of like Spider-Man. These are part of the cytoplasm. The analogy is for my students, it's kind of like you're sitting there as a white blood cell. Bacteria comes back, and then you pull them in and you phagocytize them. You engulf your membrane and you destroy them. And that's what you see happening over here on the right. So this is another nonspecific defense because it's going to happen the same regardless of what the pathogen happens to be. But the reason we're here tonight is to not just talk about nonspecific defenses, we want to talk about this guy right here called a specific defense. A specific defense, commonly referred to as immunity, is a defense that our body mounts directed against a specific antigen. Okay, I didn't bring my biology book, Ooh, what's an antigen? An antigen are structures that come off the membrane of a cell. 
A lot of us come out of high school biology thinking that cells are like ping pong balls. They're all kind of smooth on the surface. Nothing can be further from the truth. The surface membrane on cells looks like two porcupines in heat. There's all kinds of stuff coming off the surface there. It's kind of like the New York skyline with antennas and stuff coming off there. And you can kind of see you know, a graphic depiction of what this might look like. And these antigens that come off do all kinds of stuff. It allows cells to communicate with each other. It allows certain molecules to dock. They can be made out of carbohydrates. They can be made out of lipids. They can be made out of lipo. There are all kinds of molecular combinations. But they're really important because some of these antigens are there to say, hey, I belong here. These antigens can be what we call self-antigens. Self-antigens are saying, you know what? I belong here. It's kind of like if you're working at a high security place of, you know, of, of business. You have a little badge, okay? And let's say you're at a maximum security place and then nobody's allowed in there because you're working on government contracts. The security force has orders that if you don't match your security badge, they shoot you. Don't forget your badge going to work, okay? So every time you go past the security guard, they check your badge, they take your face, you're good to go. If they don't match, boom. This is the security badge. There are antigens on every single cell in your body that say, I'm mammal, I'm human, I'm Sarah, and I'm Sarah's ovary cell. It's that specific. What happens if you're a uterine cell and you wind up in the ovary part of town? Bad things, okay? We have ovarian cysts that begin to form. So not only are these antigens specific for I belong in this body, but where I belong in the body. So if these antigens are discovered by the security guards, the white blood cells, to not be from your body, guess what? We mount an attack. So you have to have the self-antigens, and every single cell in your body has these, should have them. What happens if they're carrying the wrong security badge, or the security badge got coffee spilled on it? This is how we get into autoimmune disorders, where we mistakenly determine that our cells that belong in our body aren't supposed to be there. Type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's, lupus, the list goes on. And so these are kind of mistakes of the system. What's a non-self antigen? The guys that don't belong there that I just described. We sometimes call these foreign antigens. This is an issue, isn't it, when we talk about organ and tissue transplants? Because if we take Sarah's kidney out and put it into John's body, while John is still on the table, before we've sewn John up, John's body has recognized this isn't my, bo this isn't my kidney. And John's body will start an immune response to try and destroy it because it has non-self antigens. So what do we do about that? Immunosuppressant drugs, you probably know them as anti-rejection drugs and then some other things that can be done. So it's these non-self antigens that stimulate the response of our immune response. So here's what we're going to talk about. We're, we just talked about specific defenses and non-specific defenses. The specific defenses we see here, remember it requires an antigen. What kind of antigen to stimulate this? Self or non-self? Non-self, right? We always say give, give them a sense of accomplishment. Self or non-self? Non-self. Did that hurt? I don't ask for much. Let's try this again. Self or non-self? Non-self. See, now don't we feel better about our accomplishment? Okay, so here we have some non-self antigens. They wind up in the body and then they're detected. One of two things can happen in specific defense. That activates some of our phagocytes or some of our T cells to destroy these invading cells in our virus in some manner. Another option, one that we're concerned about here tonight, is we come down here and we get what's called antibody-mediated immunity. The goal here is these special cells called B cells are going to produce what? Antibodies. What are antibodies? Antibodies are proteins. They're not cells. They're proteins. Why do we care? They do magic stuff. We're not going to talk about what antibodies do tonight. As I tell my students, we're going to talk about antibodies for several weeks, and we're going to say what they do is magic. We'll talk about the magic later on. The magic tonight is these antibodies are capable of destroying invading pathogens or viruses that have what? Non-self antigens. So the goal of vaccinations, the goal of what we're talking about tonight is to convince these little guys right here, these B cells, to produce antibodies. And then things are going well for us. So let's take a look at what happens once we convince these B cells to produce antibodies. Two things can happen, or for two events can happen. Something called a primary immune response. Primary immune response is when we begin this activation of antibodies for the very first time that we've seen that pathogen. 
Okay? So if we've never had that exact pathogen, that species of bacteria, that type of virus in our body before, the body goes, what's this? We're being invaded. But our body's not very smart. It kind of sits around and goes, well, what do you think we should do? I mean, we're being invaded. Well, I don't know. Let's see how they behave. And let's go ahead and wait. Well, it doesn't look like they're behaving very well. What should we do? We can have another meeting tomorrow and decide tomorrow what we should do. And this goes on and on because this whole reaction is governed by lower level management. Things called plasma and helper T cells. These plasma and helper T cells eventually, once things aren't going well, say, you know what? Maybe we should do some antibody production. This takes five to 10 days. It takes five to 10 days. Five, five days for you 20 somethings. Grandma, maybe 10 days. Meanwhile, things aren't going well for us in the body. Now, it doesn't mean these pathogens are unchallenged. There are, remember, non-specific defenses to try and challenge us, but we don't want that. We don't want the reserve for it. We want the main fighting forces to come. So these antibodies could take five to 10 days. And these antibodies, because they're just proteins, they're not alive, they can last months, sometimes years. We used to think they lasted our whole life. That was such a wonderful time back then when we believed that. So this is a primary immune response. First time we ever encountered that specific one. So I tell my students, let's assume you go out and you lick the water fountain, okay? Because it's your behavior. You like to lick water fountains. So you get a drink and you lick the water fountain. This is the first time you've licked that water fountain. You get a whole host of microbes you've never had before. Boom, you're slamming into a primary immune response. Five to 10 days later, you might stop vomiting. Okay, so what happens with the secondary immune response? This is when we have a response after our repeat exposure to the exact same pathogen. So for some reason, a week and a half later, you're feeling better, you get another drink, and you say, oh, me amour, it's been a week since I've licked you. So you lick the water fountain again, okay? It's the same water fountain. It's the same guys growing on there. So boom, you get infected with the exact same pathogen you did before. Now, we say it's a secondary immune response. What does that mean? When we had our first response, those cells that were involved in that first response weren't all consumed in the response. Some of them survived. They live on as what we call what? Memory B and T cells. Think of it this way. Here's a good military analogy. Is that when we look at you know, Iraq part one, the prequel, okay? After Iraq part one, the prequel, we had a lot of military personnel that came back and we strongly encouraged them to go into the reserves. And a lot of them did. When we had Iraq part two, the sequel, okay? Was there a benefit of having those same military personnel come back? They've already engaged the enemy before. They know what the enemy looked like. They're familiar with the tactics of the enemy and they were successful in their first fight and they were not destroyed during the first fight with the enemy. Isn't this a group we want to have back? That's what the memory B and T cells are. They were involved in the first war with the invading pathogen. They survived, they remember. Do they need to wait five to 10 days to know that this is a bad invasion? No. So it turns out in a secondary immune response, you're producing antibodies in one to two days. Doesn't that beat the bejeebers out of that whole week and a half thing? Sure, okay. But here's something else more important than that. Not only do we get antibodies in one to two days versus five to 10, the antibodies are produced in phenomenal numbers. It's kind of like, you know, we remembered what happened when you invaded us last time. We're not gonna do this again. Take a look at this. It's science, we have to have a data table. We've had one already. We must have a graph, okay? It's, it's in our DNA. Let's get them out of the way and we'll go to the pictures of the puppies pretty soon, okay? So what we have here on the on the y-axis over here, we have the antibody concentration in our plasma, in our blood. On the x-axis down here, the horizontal axis, we have the passage in time measured in weeks. One week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Okay? Now, let's see if you're paying attention, class. In a primary immune response, how many days did it take to produce antibodies? Five to 10. And a secondary immune response? One to, one. one to two. Okay, so we're gonna look at these blue and red lines here represent an antibody. This antibody here is called IgG. And so let's assume over here, here's day seven, so right, it's week number one. At day five, we lick the water fountain, okay? By day six and seven, we're not doing very well. So it turns out, I'm sorry, back here, we lick the water fountain here at day number one. It takes us up to day five to where we start producing antibodies, and we're at about day 10 before we reach the peak. If that's successful, what happens? The antibodies tend to decrease in numbers. We go, oh yeah, I can, walk. I can lick any water fountain, okay? Then you go back, and for God knows what reason, 
you decide to do it again. It's like playing on the freeway. May have worked the first time, not necessarily the second time. So we come over here, here's day one. We lick the very same water fountain. Look what happens. At day number one, look what happens to the production of antibodies. Are we waiting five to 10 days? No, but look at how many we produced over here. Look at what we're gonna do in the secondary response. Sweet. There's an, going back to kind of the military parlance, there's something in military strategy that's called the Powell Doctrine, after Colin Powell. His, his strategy was, if you think in order to win the battle, you need 100 tanks, send in 1,000. If you need 50 bombers, send in 100. If you need 10,000 military personnel, send in 50,000. Make sure that you have overwhelming response so you kind of win or you win. You win. This is what we're experiencing over here. We're saying, you know what? We remember last time you were here. Apparently, we didn't wipe you out, because here you are again. Your body doesn't know you licked the water fountain again, okay? For all it knows, you weren't completely wiped out the first time. So look at that. We get a response in one to two days, and a phenomenal amount of antibodies produced. So, would you rather have a primary or secondary immune response? Don't make me angry. What do we want? Otherwise, everybody has to lick the water fountain away. Secondary, okay? We want to have a secondary, okay? How could you trick your body into initiating a primary immune response? Vaccines, vaccinations. Because in a vaccination, we're going to inject into the person something that stimulates that first response. The vaccine may actually have the dead pathogen. It may have a weakened version of the pathogen. It may have a portion of it, just a little antigen. It might have a little section of the membrane. It might even have just the toxins produced by the organism. You say, which do you use? Ah, uh, you hit it on the head. This is why we don't come up with vaccines in 24 hours, because it takes years of research to figure out what is it that triggers the response in our body to that pathogen. Is it the antigen? Is it the weakened organism? Is it the dead organism? Is it as toxins? What is it that actually stimulates that response? That's what takes up a lot of the research time. So by giving somebody a vaccination, and by the way, the pharmaceutical product is called the vaccine, right? The procedure is called the vaccination, and what do you gain from it? Immunization. Sometimes we call the process immunization, but you become, you get immunity, right? So take the vaccine through the process called vaccination. If all goes well, you get immunity. So how does this work? Why does this work? Because we're tricking our body into thinking it's being invaded, but is it really? No. Does your body know that? No. It has everybody show up to the fight. You produce B cells, you produce memory cells, you produce memory T cells, and guess what? You also produce antibodies. But all the army is showing up to the fight, but is there an enemy to fight? No. So you have antibodies produced already. Here we go. <laughs> what is the advantage of tricking your body into a primary immune response? Because you benefit from a secondary immune response if you ever get infected. So think about this. With respect to influenza vaccines, we always want people five or under, 50 or over to be first in line. How come? because we don't want somebody, you know, 70, 80 years old to wait five to 10 days to produce their first antibodies. That might not be a good outcome. We want them to respond with a phenomenal number of antibodies in what, one to two days. And so the advantage of the vaccination is to trick that body to get through its primary immune response. So if the pathogen actually does make it into our body inadvertently, we're good to go. We're armed for bear. Have you heard of this concept herd immunity before. Herd immunity, in, in medical parlance, we call community immunity because it's melodic and we always want to show that we have rhythm, okay? But it turns out that nobody's really using the community immunity. We have this kind of this herd immunity. What does it mean? You hear people commonly say, you know what? I don't have my kids vaccinated and they're fine. They don't get sick at all. What, they sh what should they say to all the parents that vaccinated? Thank you, okay? Thank you. Take a look up here. On the left-hand side, all the blue guys right here, all these blue guys, these are not immunized and they're still healthy. The red guys that we see over here, the red guys, these are not immunized and they're sick. So when we get a couple sick people in with a bunch of non-immunized, guess what's going to happen to that pathogen? It's going to move through the population, isn't it? And a great deal of the population is gonna become sick as indicated by red. This is what happened in unimmunized populations. 
A couple people come in and the whole population could possibly get sick. Look down here. The yellow guys right here, the yellow guys are healthy and they're vaccinated. So what happens now if we have a sick person in red who comes into that population? We're still going to spread to a lot of the blue people like we did up here who are unvaccinated. They're getting to become sick now, but those that were vaccinated do not get sick. Over here on the left, what happens when the majority of the population in yellow is vaccinated? Now we have some in blue that are unvaccinated. And then we have the pathogen introduced. Is the population going to get sick? Probably not. How come? Because those that are unimmunized, excuse me, the blue guys right here, those that are unimmunized and healthy benefit from what? All of those in the herd that are immunized, that are vaccinated. This concept first came with cattle, cattle ranchers. Cattle ranchers who may have thousands or tens of thousands of head spread over maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of acres ask the question, do I need to go out and capture every single head of stock and vaccinate them all to ensure the safety of my herd? And they figured out, my God, almost 30 years ago. For most diseases, no, you need to vaccinate maybe 80, 85% of the herd. And those others that aren't vaccinated, in most cases, will gain benefit. So when we see a population of humans, for instance, where the vast, whoa, where the vast majority, uh, you want to see that now, don't you? Just wait, there's more, we'll be there in a minute, okay? So, so when you see this, these little blue guys right here are the people who say, my kids aren't vaccinated and they're perfectly healthy. They should be saying thank you to what? All of the yellow vaccinated people. You say, well, what's the magic number? How many do we need? 90% of the herd has to be vaccinated? 80? It depends. We come over here. There's something that we look at that's called, it's called r naught. It's r naught is the basic reproduction ratio or a number. What does that mean? The r naught value is the average number of cases in an uninfected population that one infected person generates over the course of the infectious period of that pathogen in an otherwise uninfected population, which is to say, how infectious is that disease? So are all diseases equally threatening? No, some have a higher propensity for moving through the population. And that's what this R not number is right here. So if we take a look up here at some different types of uh, value of mumps, the R not value is four to seven. Which one is more dangerous and goes into population, mumps or measles? Measles. Look at the R naught number. It's 18. Down here, if R is less than 1, the infection will die out in the population. It's not virulent enough. It's not potent enough to make it to the population. If it's more than 1, the infection will be able to persist and spread in the population. Take a look at that number now. That's pretty significant, isn't it? So you say, okay, so what's the threshold for herd immunity? For the mumps, because of its r naught value, if we could get 75 to 86% of the population vaccinated, we're good. We have herd immunity. Look down here, though. Pertussis, whooping cough, higher threshold, right? So it's a little variable. You can see they're all in the 80 to 90 category. Now we start looking at portions of population that 10%, 12%, 14% have exemptions. Do we now start to see that those small numbers, even 5, 10, could be a concern? Because if we have 8, 9, 10% of the students that aren't vaccinated, we're starting to lose our what? Herd immunity, our community immunity. <laughs> I'll just leave it there for a minute. Yes, yes, it's Photoshop. Send me no emails. I took no infant on the carpeting and threw syringes at it. So how did we get here, you know? Why are we where we are today? Well. Let's take a look. Question is, and you know the answer to this probably because you're a learned group, is there a disconnect between science and the public? <laughs> okay. So what we have here, this is from the Pew Research Center. They surveyed members of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. So these are the eggheads in science, the big players, the PhDs, and said, okay, what do you think about a variety of these different um, items? And I'll read these to you because the font's a little fuzzy here. The first one right here says, is it safe to eat genetically modified food? Scientists said, 88% of them said, you betcha. Okay, give me a two-headed chicken. I'm good with that, okay? <laughs> U.S. adults, 37%. Look at the difference, 51% gap. Okay, that's a current topic, we get that. Okay, the second one, are you favoring use of animals in research? Scientists, 89, public, 47, pretty big gap. 
safe to eat foods grown with pesticides. Humans have evolved over time. This is where we're going, okay? Scientists, 98%. Gee, that's kind of opposite of what we hear, isn't it? Most scientists don't accept evolution. They're just afraid to say so. Well, they apparently weren't surveyed here, okay? And then look at the public, 65%, a 33% gap right here. Look at this one. Childhood vaccines such as measles, mumps, and rubella, MMR, should be required. 86% and 68, only an 18% gap. Whoa, so maybe the people who don't accept evolution aren't the same people who don't accept vaccines. The numbers are a little confusing there initially. Down here, how about climate change? Climate change is mostly due to human activity. 37 point gap right here. Whoa, we can see that that's even more significant than the evolution gap. We have fewer people accepting the science of climate change than accept evolutionary theory. How did we get here? How many know this guy? Yeah, Andrew Wakefield, he's being, of course, demonized right now as being the person who's to blame for the measles dust right now. Andrew Wakefield and 12 of his closest friends <laughs> published a paper in 1998 in The Lancet. The Lancet is the by most standards, the most prestigious medical journal published in the UK. And in this article, and it's a complex article actually, he suggested there was a link between vaccinations, especially vaccinations that are piggyback. Like when you get the MMR, it's three vaccinations at once, isn't it? So his suggestion was that somehow, still to be determined, that compromised your immunity and somehow allowed you to get diseases that otherwise you wouldn't get. He's actually a gastroenterologist, so he had an interesting spin on that. And so he also said that, you know, there's also mercury, of course, that was contained in, as a preservative in many vaccines at the time, that be it the mercury or be it the multiple vaccinations, that this, without a doubt, must cause the increase we're seeing in what disease? In autism, in autism. Is there an increase in autism in the United States? Without a doubt, unequivocally, there's no doubt about it. Do we have a reason for it yet? No, we do not. As I've spoken about before to this group, is that in science, we try and first of all establish correlation. If there's correlation, then we look for causation. The example, we've seen that without a doubt, you know, crime, crime in Mexico has been increasing dramatically as the sale of iPhones has increased in the US. <laughs> you can chart them, <clears throat> there it go, parallel, okay? So does the sale of iPhones in the US have anything to do with the increase of crime in Mexico? I'm guessing no. We could do a study if you could get the grant. I'm thinking no. But is there an apparent correlation between the two? Sure. And that's what science needs first. Then we say, can we have causation? Can we demonstrate cause and effect? And so the initial question here was, could there be correlation between the increase in vaccinations and autism? Yeah, there was a correlation. But was there causation? No. His paper suggested didn't suggest, said that there was, he and his other 12 authors. And this is what became the poster paper, if you will, for the anti-vaccination movement. And this, remember, is back in 1998. It became quite obvious that the data was falsified. And since that time, 10 to the 13 authors have rescinded, uh, retracted their findings. It took The Lancet until what? 2010, do the math, 12 years to say we got taken on this. And it's embarrassing for those of us in science because these papers are supposed to be peer reviewed to the nth degree. This one slipped through the crack. It's a tuck your tail, hang your head for the body of science. So what was the outcome here? There's absolutely no doubt unequivocally that his paper was fraudulent and the fact that was determined by the British Board of Medicine, his medical license has been permanently revoked. But yeah, it doesn't matter. He was out there in the lecture circuit so, so long that we had all kinds of damage done. Autism Speaks is one of the four national autism research advocacy groups. This is their position statement, the entire position statement on vaccinations from their website from a week ago. Over the last two decades, Extensive research has asked whether there is any link between childhood vaccinations and autism. The results of this research are clear. Vaccines do not cause autism. We urge that all children be fully vaccinated. This is the National Advocacy Group for Autism Research. We've put this one to bed. We know for sure that there is no relationship between autism and vaccines. But we still have people out there who are insisting that that is the case. This does a disservice 
to science because we need to be concentrating in other areas. Autism is still a really prevalent condition. We still don't know what's going on. We need to move on. This is what science does. We've demonstrated there's no causation between vaccinations and autism. Boom. Now we move on and look at another possible influence. How much do you love this picture? <laughs> Notice the sores. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, and then we have brochures like this. This is one of my colleagues at the college gave me this. He said, hey, you're interested in giving a talk on vaccinations. Look what I just brought back from my chiropractor's office. So at the top here we have, by the time a child, whoa, by the time a child is six months old, they are injected with at least 62 vaccines. I thought that would be a lot. At 18 months, 87. At six years, at least 101. We'll come back to that in just a second, okay? <laughs> But I want to get you to point number two here on their 18-point list. To protect my children from vaccines, I will not get them vaccinated because it's the vaccinated children who have autism, asthma, allergies, skin disorders, immune system disorders, neurological disorders, ADD, ADDH, other behavioral disorders, meningitis, dyslexia, hearing and vision problems, and these conditions are rare or never encountered in unvaccinated children. Okay. Other conditions linked to vaccination include uh, pervasive developmental disorder, Asperger's syndrome, eczema, <laughs> explains it, okay, encephalitis, Guillain-Barr syndrome, convulsions, and it goes on for three paragraphs, but finishes with unvaccinated children don't get these. Absolute nonsense. So it goes on, but these things are out there in your local whatever chiropractor, or, you know, herbal doctor's office. And people read these things and you think, wow, you know, these posters, these handouts, it must be true. And it goes on, including the one I love down here, which is there is no proof that the polio vaccine decreased polio. <laughs> if it's printed, it must be true. And it is on printed on clay paper. It's a very nice brochure. And these are available at the website, by the way. Okay. And so let's go back to the original statement here. By the time a child is six months old, they are injected with at least 62 vaccines. I thought, that's a lot. When all else fails, check the data. So I went to the CDC website because that's what they're claiming, right, according to CDC. So here's the chart. So at birth, they're supposed to have the first injection of Hep B. Within one to two months, the second injection. And from six to 18, the third injection. So that's one, two, three. At two months, the RV injection. At four months, so let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, whoops, 19, 20, 20, 20, and you go through here, and then for influenza, they have to get 12 because it's twice for them. So if you do the math, you think, wow, is that really 100 to 1? Well, it's set, if we take a look, we find out that no, it is not. That's 19 vaccinations at six months, not 62. It's 27 vaccinations in 18 months, not 87. And it's 38 vaccinations at six years, not 101. But people read this and go, that's amazing, getting back to the little baby that had all the, the needles in it, okay? So in all those fells, of course, we want to do what? We want to take a look at the data. And we find out that 10 diseases are presented, are prevented with 38 vaccinations. That's pretty impressive, okay? Is there a relationship between the acceptance of global warming, evolution, and vaccinations? So you think, it's got to be the same group, right? It's the same Cracker Barrel here, okay? So let's take a look. Global warming. So is it human caused? 50% of the population surveyed here said, yeah, okay? Is it naturally caused? 20%. Is there no warming at all? 30%. That hand in the sand. Okay. So over here, human evolution. 50% said, I believe in evolution, uh, okay? And then another 50-ish percent said, I disbelieve. Now let's come over here and compare this to this. This question is, the health benefits of obtaining generally recommended childhood vaccinations outweigh the health risk. In other words, it's a good thing to get vaccinations. Look at this. Those who said that global warming is human-caused, only 50% said that, but 80% said that vaccinations are good. So the disbelief in evolution doesn't correlate to a disbelief in the benefit of vaccinations, okay? We take a look over here. Those that said that global warming is naturally caused had an 82% belief that vaccinations are good. Those that said there's no warming <laughs> still understood, 75% of them, that vaccinations are good. Look down here, human evolution. The 50% here that said that evolution over here didn't occur, look at this, 
75% of them said vaccinations are good. So the question is, is there a relationship between the acceptance of global warming, evolution, and vaccinations as valid science? And the answer is what? No, there is not. Is there a relationship between religiosity, science comprehension, and approval of vaccinations? Take a look here. Again, sorry about the small font. On the left-hand side here, we have there's solid evidence of global warming. Human beings, as we know them, develop from earlier sources of animals. There are benefits to vaccination. Look at this. Here we have low religiosity and low science comprehension. 50% of them said, yep, I'm good that there's solid evidence of global warming. That same group over here has said, 75% of them, human beings evolved from earlier forms. But look at that. About another 75%, the same group here, said I'm okay with vaccinations. So even though they, let's go down here, low religiosity, high science comprehension. 75% said, yep, there's solid evidence for global warming. Look at over here. So low religiosity, high science comprehension. Look at this, really high over here on the fact that humans evolve. But look at over here, still high over here. What's the point? Come down here. High religiosity, low science comprehension. Look at that, 25%, look over here. You see what this is showing? The fact that you have low beliefs in global warming as being true science or evolution in no way affects your acceptance of vaccinations. Counterintuitive. So when we say it's the same group, is it the same group? Apparently not, okay? How about this? You know, let's go here. Do people believe that getting a vaccine increases the risk of getting that disease? Do you think this is why people are not getting vaccinations? Well, take a look, okay? The question was asked, children who, were, who received generally recommended childhood vaccinations have a higher risk of developing autism, developing diabetes, developing cancer. Look at that. In all cases, would they say, no, that's not true. So are people not getting vaccinations because they think they're gonna get the disease? Hmm, clearly not, okay? That's not the case. Do people have a negative view of parents that do not vaccinate their children? So the question was, I would have a negative statement. I would have a negative view of parents who decided not to have their children vaccinated. Look at that. About 70% of the people vaccinated, yeah, that's true. I think that if you don't vaccinate your children, I'm gonna think negatively of you. So are people not getting vaccinated because they're worried about what people are gonna think? Uh, apparently not. That's not the case either. I'm sorry, that is the case rather that, that do people do have a negative view. Take a look at this. Is there a relationship between political views and views on vaccinations? Here we have extremely high risk, low risk. Here we have very liberal, strong Democrat, liberal Democrat, moderate independent. We used to have those, okay? <laughs> conservative Republican, and then very conservative, strong Republican. The question is, do you think there's a risk to legalizing marijuana? Look at this, the very liberal Democrat said, pass the roach, okay? <laughs> Over here, <laughs> I'm sorry about that for all of you under 12 in the group, okay? So over here, the very conservative strong Republicans said, yeah, that's an issue. Look at gun ownership. Democrats, liberals said, oh, we don't want to do that. Republicans said, lock and load, okay? Over here for global warming, the liberal Democrats thought, that's an extremely dangerous situation. Conservative Republicans said, not a problem. I have to buy fewer jackets, okay? Look at childhood vaccines. Pretty constant across all groups. We can't blame it on the insert here, your favorite whipping post, because it's pretty consistent across there, isn't it? Is there a relationship between political views and views on vaccinations? This one got a little further. We won't go through this one. This breaks it down into every conceivable you know, category. We have conservative Republican white male, conservative <laughs> Republican white female, liberal Democrat white male, you name it, but it shows that over here, that here are their different views on these different subjects. Look over here. They're all on the same page on our vaccinations good. Ouch. As we say in science, another perfectly good hypothesis torpedoed by the data, okay? What's going on? So then, <laughs> what's the reason for the anti-vaccination movement then? Clearly, it's not political ideology. It's not male, it's not female, it's not black, it's not white, it's not Hispanic. All those classic demographic pigeonholes aren't working very well here. 
So could it be just plain old lack of knowledge of this aspect of science? My suggestion might be yes, or is it a question of it's my paradigm and I'm sticking to it? The graph I showed you that looked at science comprehension and the beliefs in vaccinations, et cetera, was based upon the National Science Foundation indicators, but they chose 11 of them out of the almost 300 that are there. So they chose 11. So is that a good measurement? Uh, probably not. I would suggest that maybe what we're looking at here is this is an aspect of science that people just don't know about. So when they're given a brochure that's nice and shiny like the one I showed you, they're more likely to accept that. And also, it's my paradigm and I'm sticking to it, right? We, everybody in this room, has our paradigms that have worked for us to this point. We're very resistant to change them. I've cited, some of you know, um, a, a friend of mine um, who, who, um, as a, who was a Calvin professor for many, many years. And he told me once, he says, you know, Greg, he says, it's really difficult to change somebody's view, somebody's paradigm when they've arrived at that paradigm illogically in the first place. So his full statement was, Greg, you can't use logic to change somebody's mind when they arrived at their position illogically in the first place, right? We've all tried to do it. So sometimes, you know, whether it's evolution denying, whether it's climate change denying, whether it's vaccine denying, there's nothing you're going to do that's going to change their paradigm if they arrived at that illogically in the first place. If they received the brochure from the chiropractor's office first, you're second fiddle possibly at that point. So why does it matter? Why do vaccinations matter? It seems amazing that in 2015 that came out of my mouth, okay? <laughs> why are we having this conversation? Let's check our watch for which century we're in. Children with vaccine exemptions may be up to 22 times more likely. So those students that are granted an exception for a vaccination in school may be up to 22 times more likely to contract measles in an outbreak than those children who are vaccinated. This is from the Journal of American Medical Association published way back in 2000. Why should I vaccinate my kids? Take a look at these numbers from the early 1960s. Vaccination hit its, its crescendo and its big push in the early 60s. So in the, prior to 1960, we had four to 500 deaths per year from what, okay? From, from uh, we can see here, uh, where are we right here? Preventable diseases, vaccine preventable diseases. So here, this is just measles. Four to 500 deaths per year, 48,000 hospitalizations, 4,000 have encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain. Now that we have this groundswell of vaccinations, look where we are now, okay? Look at these low numbers, 2001 to, uh-oh, uh-oh. Look at that, 603 for measles by the end of last year, and it's still growing. Could there be an inverse relationship between vaccination rates and an increase here of measles? Immunization rates around the world continue to increase. Look at this, this is from World Health Organization. We look at diphtheria, 84% of the world population. That's astounding. That includes the back villages of Chad. Okay, so I mean, to think about this, you know, polio, 84%, measles, 84, hepatitis B, 81, pneumococcal pneumonia is a new vaccine, so we're still down at 25%, same thing with the rotavirus, it's down at 14. Worldwide, everybody's on this page. Here we are again in the US, somewhere in the table of contents. What is the leading cause of death for those less than 44 years old? What is it, group? So if you're 44 or under, according to the Centers for Disease Control, what's your greatest probability of death? Accidents, all accidents. You don't have to worry about any diseases. If you're under 44, we recognize there's a huge footnote there, okay? The most common, there are a lot of diseases we die of, but the most common is going to be accidents. What was the leading cause of death for those under 44 prior to vaccines? Disease, communicable disease. I like to tell my students, go to one of the historical cemeteries that we have here in Michigan, and we have no shortage. Go to one of the historical cemeteries and take a look at the age of the people that are buried there. You will see at least half of the cemetery are children who were buried before their 12th birthday. Because your chance of making it past 12 was very, very remote. As parents, do we worry about our children dying of communicable diseases before they're 44? <laughs> no. So you think, why is that? Well, take a look at what vaccinations have done. Influenza, 
<clears throat> influenza occurs globally with an annual attack rate estimated between 5 to 10 percent in adults, 3 to 5 times that rate in children, 20 to 30 percent. Worldwide, these annual epidemics of influenza, the common flu, right, take 3 to 5 million cases of severe illness and about a quarter of a million to half a million deaths occur each year. What about measles? Measles remain one of the leading causes of death among young children. <clears throat> Estimated before vaccination, 2.6 million deaths per year. This is prior to 1980. Measles vaccinations resulted in a 75% drop in measles deaths between 2000 and 2013, preventing an estimated 15.6 million deaths, contrary to the brochure. Okay? In 2013, there were 145,000 measles deaths globally, about 400 deaths per day, 16 deaths per hour, mostly children under the age five. And that's with the vaccines we need to get more people vaccinated. Hepatitis B. Estimated 240 million people are chronically infected, infected, which is too bad because there is a vaccine. Approximately 780,000 people die per year of hepatitis B. The vaccine against B, hepatitis B, has been available since 1982. Look at that number. It's 95% effective. In developing a vaccine, we will wet our collective immunological pants if we can get an efficacy rate Effectiveness of 80 to 85 percent. That's the died and gone to heaven for the flu vaccine. This is at 95 percent, and some people still aren't getting it. I guess hepatitis is fun. <laughs> what about the risk of vaccines? People say, well, you know, you can get something bad can happen. Of course, something bad can happen when you get your tonsils out, when you get your wisdom teeth out, when you cross the street. It's all a numbers game, isn't it? Okay. We think nothing twice about going and getting X surgeries X, Y, Z. Take a look at this. Out of the more than 100 million immunizations given per year in just the United States, the federal government's vaccine injury compensation program receives an average of 1,200 claims, complaints. They pay out 284 claims per year. That's one in 352,000. Let's assume that they should have paid out twice as much if you want, or three times, which is basically an admission of guilt that this vaccine caused this this malady. National Weather Service says you have a 1 in 12,000 chance of getting hit by lightning. You have a 1 in 352,000 chance of having a bad effect from a vaccine that causes permanent disability or death. It's a numbers game, isn't it? In closing here, close to closing, this website here, Harvard Law, Bill of Health, this gentleman right here, a lot of people wouldn't call a gentleman anymore, because boy did he stir the pot. He's a bioethicist. He posted this blog site, which is an unmoderated blog site, until his post. They had to close it down because the server crashed. <clears throat> okay? He said, should there be liability for failure to vaccinate? This is his, these are his words, repeat with all of the grammatical errors. I think there should be a right to decide not to vaccinate your child. I think most of us would agree with that. Okay? But we have been far too lenient in putting up with the consequences of that lousy choice. If your kid gets the measles and makes my kid sick, it can happen since vaccines are not 100% effective, or my newborn baby dies, newborns can't benefit from vaccines, or my wife miscarries, fetuses are especially at high risk, then shouldn't I be able to sue you for the harm you have done? If you know the dangers of measles, or for that matter, whooping cough or mumps, and you still choose to put others at risk, should you be exempt from the consequences of that choice? I can choose not to drink alcohol, but if I run you over, it's my responsibility. I'm liable, I pay. I can choose not to shovel my snow for my walk, but if you fall, I pay. Why should failing to vaccinate your children or yourself be any different? You can see why it caused a little bit of comment there. And I'm not going down that road. It's food for thought for you there, okay? I want to give you a quote here in closing. Unknown person, see the silhouette? In 1736, this person said, I lost one of my sons, a fine boy of four years old, by the smallpox, taken in the common way, which means caught through the population. Because we were experimenting with vaccines in the early 1700s, even for smallpox. We would compress the pustules of people who had smallpox, take the exudate out, and then give that to a healthy person, hoping for the best, okay? 
Sometimes it worked, a lot of times it didn't. Then we recognize that you could get the same from a cow or a steer and give that to a human and it usually wouldn't cause death. But we were playing with vaccines in the early 1700s. So what this person means is that my son got this in the normal manner, not from pus harvested from our neighbors. I long regretted bitterly and still regret that I had not given it to him by inoculation, which was available in 1736. This I mention for sake of parents who omit that operation on the supposition that they should never forgive themselves if a child died under it by having a vaccination. My example showing that the regret may be the same either way and that therefore the safer route, the vaccination, should be chosen. This is Ben Franklin. He wrote this passage 50 years after the death of his son. For the rest of his life, he could not come to fact with the fact that his son's death could have been prevented. The year following his son's death, he actually produced a little pamphlet on how to provide smallpox vaccinations. It's an incontrovertible scientific fact that the earth is not flat, Pigs do not fly. <laughs> vaccines do not cause autism. And that vaccines have saved and continue to save many millions of lives. Thank you very much for listening. <clears throat> <clears throat>